If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. And just so you know, <clears throat> what, what I'm going to end up doing is I'm going I'm to split this message in half. I'm only going to present the first part this morning and, of course, the, the second part next week. So you, you need to hear both parts so you can get the entirety of the message. But I think when we hear the first part, we'll begin to understand a little better exactly what is going on. Now, just so you know, both messages, if you're a note taker, this will be good to get time to get you one of those uh, five-star, five-subject ring binder notebooks. About five pens and a few highlighters. Um, this, is, this is one that's good because if you, just so, the moment I said Second Chronicles, you know I'm probably going to be in First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Kings, Isaiah, Ezekiel. I mean, all these things begin to tie together as the prophets were being appointed during this time and period of the nation of Israel. But we're going to begin this morning by looking at Second Chronicles chapter 34. And that's where I'm going to start off, and, and we're going to kind of be back and forth, but just please keep in mind, we will be finishing this message next week. Two-part message. 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verse 8. In the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the temple, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azil, Messiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of, the son of Joaz the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. For the next few moments, and even next week when I conclude, I just want to bring a message simply entitled, That Which Is Hidden. That Which Is Hidden. You may be seated. The text we have opened with this morning is at a pivotal moment in the history of the nation of Israel. And like his great-grandfather before him, King Josiah sought to purge the land of idolatry while simultaneously reestablishing worship of the only true God. He found that the temple of God was in disrepair as neglect had taken its toll on this once prominent symbol of this proud nation. The condition of the temple only stood as a reflection of the people of the land as they no longer sought to keep the feast or worship God at all as God had commanded. Now, immediately and, and right out of the gate, it's very easy for us to make this ap uh, an application or applications to people not of our own nationality. As we ponder the Scriptures we must also make the applications to ourselves as well as to our own nation. We cannot fail to recognize how idols have been erected within this nation while the true places of worship are falling in neglect and disrepair. Also, how a once proud and God-fearing people have neglected the importance of God within their own lives. How we are told that the greatest commandment of all is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The writer of Ecclesiastes once penned, that which has been is that is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Now we would say, or simply say this morning, that history repeats itself. And I am a firm believer in this text that history does have a way of repeating itself and nations can parallel other nations. What has been done in the past has a way of, of just seemingly coming back around and, and, and raising its head here in the present. The consequences of those past indiscretions will remain true as the indiscretions are now being repeated. Now there is nothing new under the sun, according to Scripture. So the same sun that rose on our opening text is the same sun that rose this morning and the same sun that is shining on our church right now. In 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 31, 
It says that Solomon rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father, and Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his place. We must first visit this morning the point of declination in order to understand what Josiah was facing in our opening text. You see, Solomon was responsible for two things. First, he was responsible for the worship of false gods and false idols in the land of, uh, in the land of Israel. You see, the places which Josiah had to dismantle were constructed by Solomon so that he would be able to worship the gods of his many wives with his wives. And what that did entail is it taught the next generation, his sons and his grandchildren, to ignore the house of God and it is okay to worship whatever God you want to worship, ever how you want to worship, it's fine. You see, the second thing that Solomon is responsible for is the overbearing workload on the common people and the exorbitant taxation in order that Solomon would have places and palaces and, and have the luxury in life while everybody else was being broken under an extreme heavy, heavy taxation. The division occurred when, Solomon's, uh, when Solomon passed and his son Rehoboam was approached about lightening up the workload and uh, lightening up the taxes. One could attribute this to poor counsel as Scripture says he listened to younger men. But could it quite possibly be that it was a learned behavior? You see, in fact... He not only kept the taxation established by Solomon, but he increased it to the point that the people grew tired and, and then a revolt began to break out and the kingdom divided between Solomon's son Rehoboam and uh, Jeroboam. So now the reason why I went back to this is that is the point in which the kingdom itself, the kingdom of, of, of Israel, began to separate. See, Christ even said, and He warns us in the Gospels, that if a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, the house cannot stand. Now this nation is far removed from being one nation under God. The division within this nation transcends race or religion. It is beyond politics and economics. The division has found itself tapped into the heart and into the soul of this nation. As this and what we are witnessing is just simply an all-out spiritual attack. You see, this is an attack between good and evil and or light versus darkness. You see, the spiritual condition and the future of this nation is what's weighing in the balance today. Christ said that a house divided against itself cannot stand. Noting the division of the nation of Israel this morning gives us a point of reference in which we could begin to gauge the condition but possibly the progression of our nation as it relates to the Word of God. Now before I continue into just a portion we're going to go over this morning, I want to share with you from this point forward, I am not predicting anything. Nothing. I am not saying anybody is good or anybody is bad. Though I will mention names. The only thing that I am doing this morning is establishing a pattern in Scripture and to see what that pattern might reveal. So are we good on that? So don't nobody go out and say, Paul said this is going to happen and this is the date and this is the time. I'm not doing that at all. I'm just simply establishing a pattern. So let's begin. When studying the divided kingdoms, we are all familiar with the pattern of good king, bad king. Good king, bad king. There's another phrase that should capture our attention as well. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, more so than, and then it would mention a previous king or administration's name. 
You see, as the division continued to increase between the northern and southern kingdoms, over time, we see the digression or the condition of the king, which is a reflection of the kingdom itself. Now, starting from our point of reference, when Solomon died and the kingdom began to divide, starting from there to the last good king, King Josiah, our opening text this morning, that division spans 369 years. And this also, this morning, will begin the pattern for the nation and, and what we, uh, hopefully we see this morning, if I can convey it the way I, the way I received it. A biblical pattern is established when a nation comes into covenant agreement with God. And when that happens, a spiritual clock begins. You can go through Scripture and you can see it. Anytime Israel fell out of covenant with God, or, or the, the spiritual time was no longer counted because they were no longer in covenant with God. The United States of America came into covenant agreement with God at the establishment of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the Mayflower Compact in 1630. And that is when the spiritual clock would have started for the United States of America. Now let's do some quick, quick math. I told you that the divided kingdom from the death of Solomon to the last good king Josiah was 300... Let me look at my years and make sure I'm right. 396 years. I'm, I, that's a missed type. 369. It's 369 years. Sometimes studying, I get my numbers backwards. So when we go there and you begin to do the ad, 369 years of the divided kingdom, you add it to 1630, the year Massachusetts Bay Colony was established, that brings us to the year 1999, which is our next point of reference. What does 1999 hold or could it hold that would begin to paint a picture for us? Well, first of all, we know that some of the signs of the, of the time of the end is going to be blood, fire, pillars of smoke, earthquakes, different, various things happening in different places. So in 1999, worldwide, there was 1,637 earthquakes on the face of the earth that entire year. So the earth began to shake and began to quake. But was that the end? No, that is just the beginning of birth pains. That is just the beginning. What else happened that year that would bring our attention and help us to be able to paint a pattern? Remember, I established, I'm not saying anybody's good or bad. I'm just establishing a pattern. It was in 1999 that Bill Clinton was impeached at the first part of that year. Later in the spring, beginning of the summer, Clinton was also found guilty of purging himself before Congress. The reason why that one jumps out at me is because he represents the office of the President of the United States, the highest office in the land, which means he's representative of the United States. What else happened that year that could begin to elude and begin to show us a pattern? Well, it was in 1999 that, that I remember uh, was one of the most tragic, uh, to me, one of the most tragic events that, that began to occur in my lifetime at that moment, and that was the Columbine High School Massacre. That happened in 1999. From there, we begin to see other high school shootings and things begin to happen and take place. So it, things began to really digress in 1999. Here's another one that began to happen in 1999. President Bush, well, Governor Bush of Texas at that time, was seeking the Republican ticket to run for President of the United States in the summer of 1999. Put a pin on that one. Put a pin on that one. All right, so now I've carried you 309 and, and 369 years. I'm struggling with numbers this morning. That is the divided kingdom up to the last good king, Josiah. After Josiah, there are still four more kings left. They were all evil in the sight of God, and each one was progressively more evil. So that begins to establish our pattern. What would happen in these last, uh, uh, last cycles? And you can see an increase of evil in the last days, and it ended with Zedekiah the last king of Israel. 
Here's another interesting pattern that begins to form in Scripture. Once you reach King Josiah, the last good king, the last four kings followed this pattern. He served for three months, then 11 years, three months, and then 11 years, ending with Zedekiah. That is our next pattern in Scripture. So when we leave our last reference point, 1999, we add 11 years to that. That brings us to the year 2010. 2010. So what happened in 2010 compared to 1999 that maybe we can begin to see a pattern begin to emerge? Well, I share with you that in 1999 there was 1,637 earthquakes worldwide. In 2010, 2,383 worldwide. That is a 45.5% increase or jump just in an 11-year span. We are already seeing record numbers of earthquakes just in our short month of January this year. That they have even said that we could possibly break records of the most earthquakes worldwide in any other year possible. Not only were there more earthquakes, what you also began to see in 2010 was that the strength of the earthquakes or the strength of volcanic eruptions were a lot stronger. Matter of fact, in 2010, the largest earthquake in recorded history occurred. Like an 8.2, 8.3 magnitude earthquake occurred. That happened in 2010. What else happened in 2010? Well, there was what we termed as the flash crash. The stock market lost in just a few moments over $1 trillion. So that begins to tie into our economy. Something else that happened in 2010. Man builds the tallest structure in Dubai. The tallest structure on the face of earth. And when I read that and was reminded that they bought, built this tower in Dubai, this tallest structure on the face of the earth, my mind went back to Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, the Tower of Babel. You're dealing with a lot of the same people, a lot of the same region. And what did they say in the verse? It says, let us therefore make a name for ourselves. Let us make a name for ourselves. Remember that phrase. Something else that happened in 2010. This is where we see morality really begin to take a, nose, a nosedive in this nation. It's because in the city of Washington, D.C., that is when same-sex marriage law went into effect, making it legal for, for men, men to marry men, women to marry women, when the Bible clearly teaches that that is unnatural affection for a man to lay with a man like he would a woman. God created Adam and Eve, he created man to be with woman, not man to be with man, or woman to be with woman. And since then, we have now seen the legalization of it across this nation. An abomination being legalized in this nation. Something else that happened in 2010. And many of you may remember this. It was in the Gulf of Mexico. You had the Deepwater Horizon oil rig explosion. And how it affected the ecosystem in Florida and, and Alabama, Mississippi, you know, the Gulf Coast states right there. But what I recall about that was, the, was when they would show images on the ocean floor showing the pipeline just pumping and spewing oil out. And it took them several weeks to be able to figure out how to go down and, and cut it off square and cap this thing off so that the oil would just quit pumping out. I mean, nightly news, you saw pictures of this oil just pumping out. Put a pin there. Here's my point and a pattern that we may see. First, we see pride. We see a, a president who was impeached but never left office and continued the digression of the office of the president of the United States. That also happened in 2010 when man built a structure and said, let us create a name for ourselves. Look what we can do. We can build the tallest structure in the world. Who needs God? Look at... The, the, uh, the, the, like I said, the, legal, the, the legalization of abomination. Look at how brother against brother, as kids begin to uh, kill each other in school and in and, and malls, and, and it began to spread and it continued. Look at how the birth pangs are getting closer and closer together with the increase of earthquakes. I told you to pin two things. I told you to pin George Bush announcing his run for the Republican ticket of presidency of the United States in the summer of 1999. I also told you in 2010 about the oil rig explosion in the Gulf. 
I only know of one individual on the face of the earth that God spoke to this individual and they shared a vision that that would happen years before it even happened. And he shared it with partners of his ministry. And he is the one, because he was governor at the time, met him at the Wailing Wall and spoke over him at the Wailing Wall before he even announced he, he ran. Look, the problem with what's going on today is, and this is what's going to cause confusion to happen in the body of Christ, is because there has been a rise of a whole bunch of false prophets in this land. But just because there are false prophets, and when we see them and they bear themselves out as being false prophets, we need to leave them alone. But there are still good men and women whom God speaks to through and by the Spirit of God that is sharing a word. And they are sharing what God has given them. But we've got to have an ear to hear and discernment to know when it is of God and when it is not. But these are the patterns that are happening. Remember, I'm giving you a pattern. All right, so let's move forward. Remember, I'm not predicting anything. I'm just showing a pattern here. What could possibly... Blind store for 2011 or 2021, 2021. Remember, we're in that 11-year cycle. So from 2010, you had 11 years, you come to this year. In 2 Kings 24 and 20, For because of the anger of the Lord this happened in Jerusalem and Judah, that He finally cast him out from His presence. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. Now, I told you I'm not predicting anything. Keep that in mind. Bear that out. What pattern? What things could we see? Well, we're establishing a pattern. Future events and timing of all things are only in the hands of God and only God knows. But Scripture bears out and does indicate what we might witness in the future. And I'm just calling this one just so to stick in our minds the Zedekiah factor. Because Zedekiah was the last king before Israel was carried off into captivity. What was Zedekiah's downfall? Pride. Pride. Even when he had been warned, it says that he still mocked the king of Babylon. Though the enemy was approaching and standing right at the border... Telling him, I'm getting ready to carry you off. I'm getting ready to do this. He still mocked him because he thought that the presence of God was still with him and on the nation of Israel. So when you begin to see future events, Zedekiah never realized that the presence of God left. You see, the folly of the United States of America because of prosperity and blessing will never realize when God's presence has left this nation and the hedge has been lifted, allowing the adversary to come in. They will be duped into thinking, we are the greatest military power on the face of the earth. We can do whatever we want. We got a bigger stick than somebody else does. But we never realize that if it wasn't for the presence of God, we wouldn't be where we are right now. You see, it was not long. After that, it wasn't long after I read where Zedekiah uh, 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 mocked or rebelled against the king of Babylon, that God, and this was his words because he called Nebuchadnezzar his servant, that God used his servant Nebuchadnezzar to go in and to take that nation and carry them into bondage. Here's what I want to read. Because, I, we, look, let me put to you, Babylon, Babylonian. Let me, let me give you a geographical breakdown real quick. The nation of Turkey... Syria, Kuwait, Iran, Iraq, little portions of Jordan a little bit there. They are all what we would consider to be what would have been then the nation of Babylon. Okay, that was their border. That was their boundary. Then they took over other areas. So their seat and their root, depending on where you look at a summer home or a winter home, I mean, it's in the same region. Here, a few days ago, in Tehran, Iran, Iran's judiciary chief, Abraham Rossi said, President Donald Trump, and I'm quoting this. You can go look it up for yourself. I'm going to give you a direct quote. President Donald Trump and all those responsible for the death of General Soleimani 
will not be safe on earth. He went on to say, they will witness severe revenge. What has come so far has only been glimpses, end quote. Immediately after his speech, the Ayatollah stood up, remembering, and they're calling him a martyr, Martyr General Soleimani. If you remember, we took him out with a drone strike. He stood up and reiterated the same words spoken by the judiciary chief. He says that the people responsible for the death have not seen anything yet. We're still dealing with the same people. They've been quiet for a little bit. I told you a while back, when they get quiet, you better look out. Well, here we are dealing with the same people. Here we are, 11 years later, we're at the end of our cycles. We're here where Zedekiah, we're at the last one. He's dealing with Nebuchadnezzar. We're dealing with these people. Same people. Same problem. Pride. Here's where we're going to begin. Because, put, put uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 4, and 5 up there, Brandon. And then when I read it, just go back to verse 4 for me, please. Thank you. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your, and highlight this, patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Verse 5 reads, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer. Back to verse 4. Patience and faith. What in the world is going on? Why do good people have to suffer with bad people? We've been praying for God to expose the plans of the enemy. Some of us, and let's be honest, because I mean, we, we can laugh about it. And don't be super spiritual this morning. Oh, God just hit him with that lightning bolt one time right between the eyes of me. You've had conversations with friends. They better be glad I ain't God. If I were God, I'd burn the whole place down. You've heard people say it. Be honest. I mean, come on. Here's what is happening. And we must not forget this, because this is where I got excited, even just right here to this point. And you're like, Paul, how can you get excited? You just laid a pattern out. Pride. pride. And the Scripture says pride comes before the fall. You know, we can lay out pride. We can lay out all these things. And we can see the increase. And we know birth pains are increasing. It lets us know we're getting closer to the end. Because when we see the intensity, they're getting stronger. And then, we, and then we, and the frequency comes together. Oh, man. Paul, keep it. God, the Spirit of God, help me keep this together. It says that in persecutions and tribulations that you endure. In other words, Paul is speaking to the church here. And he's saying, what you have gone through and what you have witnessed and what you are... You go through it, he tells us how, with patience and faith. Don't be in a hurry. Everything is in God's time. Let God handle everything how God wants to handle everything. Let Him handle your family. Look, get your hands off your family. Keep praying for them, but let God handle your family. Let God handle this nation, but you keep praying for it. God say, be patient. I'll tell you why He says be patient here in a minute. But most of all, He says, in your patience, keep the faith. Look, where have we placed our trust? Hopefully in God. God says, keep your faith in me. Keep your trust in me. Be patient though you're being tested. You see, there's a segment there in verse 5 that nobody wants to talk about, and it's the J word. I ain't talking about Jesus. Which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God. You see, when we hear the J word, we shut down. We don't want to hear that. We have a misunderstanding of what judgment and chastisement is all about. When God puts us through something, God's trying to make me more like Him. When, God, when I get really bad, and I know this is not politically correct and not how we raise kids today, and that's probably part of the problem with today, but when I got in trouble, I was carried to the woodshed. Sometimes they didn't make, let me wait to get to the woodshed. 
You know, let my generation older know what I'm talking about. Because what happens is, God uses these as a time to shape us, to make us, to mold us, to get out of us what is not pleasing to Him, to make us, according to Scripture, worthy to escape the wrath that is coming. See, there's a dif difference between judgment, chastisement, and wrath. I don't want to deal with either. But I'd much rather God chasten me and make me worthy to escape what is really coming. See, that brings me to the point of what is going on here and what Paul's talking about and what, and what we may be seeing and, and what we're getting ready to experience, I believe. This is Paul's personal belief. I believe there's going to be times of trials and testings coming. There's going to be things you have never witnessed and gone through before. We think we've gone through something now with, with open and close, open and close, COVID and all that. We ain't seen anything yet. And I'm not doing that because, there, see, right here is a message of hope. Because God says, you be patient, you have faith, though all of this is coming against you because the manifest judgments of God are evidence. Evidence to who? The world. I'll get to them in a minute. But I like how verse 5 ends. After the comma. After the judgment. That you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. You know what? You want to make it to heaven. You want to make it in the rapture. You don't want to be here in the wrath of God. Then you know what? You might have to go through a little something. The church might have to go through a little something. Because what we are in right now is the process in which God is getting the church ready for the kingdom. Oh, my Lord. I thought I was at a Pentecostal church this morning. I didn't realize I was at the frozen chosen. Look. What we're going through and what we're going to witness, God's saying, I'm getting you ready for the kingdom to come. Now, I'm not predicting the rapture. I told you I'm not predicting. I'm showing a pattern. I'm not predicting anything. But if, I'm predict if I am saying anything this morning, I'm just saying God's getting you ready for His kingdom to come. Yes, He says, look, for which you also suffer. Yes, you might have to suffer. Yes, you Look, none of us want to hear that. I don't want to hear it, and I don't even want to preach it. But text is text. The Word of God is truth, and He says you're going through this that you may endure. He says, which is manifest evidence. Why? We've been praying God expose the corruption. God expose them for their lies. God expose the plans of the enemy. And let everybody see what this adversary is doing on the face of the earth. What we didn't realize we were praying for is step one, God has to deal with us. Because if God deals with us, then we are the evidence that He's getting ready to deal with them. So when we begin to see trials, tribulations, testings, and these things beginning to increase in the church, then we know He's getting ready to expose them for the corruption that they're, deal that they're dealing out. He's getting ready to expose them for everything that they've gone in their lives, from sex trafficking to rigging and fixing or whatever it is that they've done. God's getting ready to bring it all to light, but He's got to deal with His own people first. 2 Thessalonians 1 and 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. God will deal with a corrupt world. God will deal with sinful people. See, that's the problem with this world today. No consequences for our actions. No consequences for when you do wrong. Everybody can just... Do what they want to, get away with it. Who cares? As long as you ain't bothering me. That's what Hezekiah, Josiah's great-grandfather said. As long as I got peace in my lifetime, I don't care what they do. See, that's where a lot of people, and that's what a, a, lot, of, a lot of people in the church and a lot of churches have done. As long as I have peace and safety, I don't care what y'all do in the world. Burn it down for all I care. Never realize it's got to come to the house of God first. Here is what, and this is why I'm closing. I told you I'm just only going to do the first part. Setting a pattern. I'll review it next week. Then we'll dig real deep next week. Here's what's happening. Here's what's going on as I close. We have seen, I hopefully, and I just hit a few things. The digression of one of the highest offices of this land from 99 to today. We have seen the digression of this nation and of its people going away from God. 
and erecting the altars of Baal on this nation. That's who the Babylonians worshipped. We've seen, and I've showed in the pattern, the increase in earthquakes by 45% in just 11 years. I don't know how much they'll increase this year. Nobody knows. Here's what it is. And I've heard this, and I read it, I've read it uh, this week, and, I, and I'm going to share this, this portion with you because I think it just applies here. It's what keeps coming to my mind. Because you remember our pattern began, or, you know, in 1999. That's before we started our 11-year cycle. Does anybody else know a major event that happened in 1999? How about Y2K? Remember, nobody knew or understood what was going to happen when we went into the year 2000. Are our computers even going to work? Is everything that is automated, is it even going to work? Look, it even caused, it even, at the time, I, you know, I'll be honest with you, at the time, all year long listen to it, myself, I said, Man, that's a bunch of junk. But then when I got what really captured my attention is when I happened to be in Florida and you see one of the biggest corporations in the world, they're getting ready. And so I thought, well, you know, there might be something to this. I mean, we know now nothing happened. Everything pretty much went on without, without a glitch. But there were a bunch of preachers preaching at that time how this was going to be the end. Christ was going to come back. It's, you know, they went through the same... Well, it didn't happen. That is a false birth pain. Because what it did was bring everybody's attention back to the possibility that Christ could come back, but He didn't. False labor. There are three trimesters in the birth or process that a woman goes through. First, second, and third. I believe, as I read and study, and as I see, and I, and I begin to see these patterns, and we'll dig, like I told you, we'll dig deeper next week. I personally believe we're in the third trimester. Here's what happens in the third trimester. There is an intense increase of muscle contraction, which means there will be more volcanic activity. There will be more earthquakes. There will be more wars and rumors of wars. All those things Christ spoke about in Matthew 24, those things will increase. But He said, but the end is not yet. What happens? Well, not only do we have to look at intensity, we've got to look at frequency. How often do they occur? Well, we see the pattern in Scripture. They're getting more frequent. We didn't, we didn't have to do it because we never made it that far. I'm just going on what we were told or, or what you read or hear sometimes. But you know, once a woman goes in, in, in contraction, you know, they start the contractions, you begin to time them. They're an hour apart. 30 minutes apart, you know, 10 minutes, you, you keep counting right on down. That's frequency. That's the frequency I'm talking about. Well, what we're seeing is not only intensification, we're seeing frequency pick up as well. It's coming closer and closer and closer and closer in these patterns. Here's my point. Before the woman can birth the baby, and before... Anything else happens, the water has to break. Before the baby can crown and begin the process of coming out, the water has to break. What, I'm, what am I trying to tell you this morning? What I believe is going to happen this year, and I'm, and I'm just saying, for me, I'm forgetting everything else because we've got to put our faith and our hope in God. Here's what I believe. God is going to first... Get everybody ready for the kingdom, those who will listen and those who will obey. He's getting kingdom people ready for His kingdom. Getting ready to meet our Lord and Savior in the air. And you know what excites me? I might possibly still be alive and of this generation where I get to go and meet my Lord. I get to fly without an airplane. If that don't excite you, I don't know what will. But we might, we're, I really believe we're possibly that generation that will do that. So he's getting a kingdom people ready for his kingdom. At the same time, he's showing this world, I'm getting ready to deal with you. And I'm getting ready to deal with the corruption in this world. What has to happen 
We see this intensification. Oh, God. We see this intensification begin to happen. That lets me know the water is getting ready to break. That lets me know that my God is getting ready to fulfill Joel 2, where He says, I will pour water out on them, on the young people and on the old people. And I'm going to bring them together because the old people have the theology, the young people have the technology and the strength and the, and the zeal to go after it. See, God says, I'm getting ready to save them and I'm getting ready to pour my Spirit out. When we see the intensification, get ready for the water to break. Look, it's not long after the water breaks. It's not long after that water breaks. That baby begins to crown, and, the, and then the baby is birthed, and then air begins to come into the baby's lungs. I'm just here to tell you, God's getting a kingdom people ready for His kingdom. That's the travail. That is the birth pains that we're going through. Then God's going to say, then I'm going to break the water, and I'm going to pour out. There's going to be a revival. It'll be short-lived, but there's going to be a powerful revival that's going to hit the face of this earth. And then... Those who are called by His name, we're going to hear the trump of God. We're going to hear a shout. And we're going to hear the Lord, come up to me. So here is my word for the world. And it's very simple. I told you the word for the church. Y'all got that one. Here's my word for the world. Get ready and repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Get ready. Make way and make straight because Jesus Christ is coming back. He's coming back soon. There is no doubt. We're going to leave this old world with a shout. We're going to give all these things will be gone. Everything will be new. Oh, Lord. I don't know how y'all sit there. I'm by right, right now, I'm just sitting here just churning like I'm on a treadmill. Look, I'm telling you, folks, we got to get our minds grasped around this. I... When I say this, I say it respectfully. I really do. I really don't care what's going on. On the news, the best thing this fast ever done, I don't know nothing's going on. I watch the weather, so I know how to dress when I leave the house. But I don't watch it. I don't let it invade my thinking. What I'm letting it invade is the Word of God coming not just in my mind, but in my belly and in my spirit because I can see the travail and I can see the water begin to break. And I realize, Paul, you're, the, the, the thing you've been talking about, the thing you've been searching for, you're getting ready to see it face to face. Get ready. And look up because our redemption is drawing nigh. Everybody, please stand.